Hello, everybody. So, we're going to be doing chapter 17. Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to learn in this chapter. So, this chapter has to deal with um, the investment of real estate, taking real estate as an investment. So there's a couple of different things that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at tax implications. We're going to be looking at um, why people invest in real estate. So really this chapter, this has been a long time coming. I actually am creating this later on in my YouTube life. And uh, the reason why is because there's not a ton of questions that are going to come out of this chapter, I do not believe, that are going to be on your test. This is a very practical uh, This is a very practical chapter. So this is the kind of chapter that you're going to look at and you're going to see this chapter and say, hey, this is a really good chapter for me to kind of understand some of the practicality of real estate. A lot of my students always ask me, hey, I'm thinking about getting involved in real estate to invest because or they're getting into real estate because they already hold investments. So they might have had a good experience with a real estate agent and they want to keep moving and grooving and do their own things. So we're going to talk about investments in real estate and what that means. So let's talk about first the advantages and the disadvantages. So first of all, um, real estate is traditionally a good investment. Um, it, it is traditionally one that people have made a lot of money in. It is something that a lot of people always have an interest in regards to, hey, I have money set aside. I think I might want to invest in real estate. That is a very, very good possibility. And here's the thing. In the next slide, we're actually going to go into why people invest in real estate, right? We're going to talk about the two different types of investors that we have when we're looking at real estate as an investment. But let's talk about some of the advantages. Usually there's a good return on this. Um, also, what happens is sometimes you have equity in a property and that will allow you to have some uh, leverage. Also, um, it typically is a hedge against inflation. Okay. Um, now, let's talk about what some disadvantages are. Okay. What some disadvantages in real estate are. The first of them being it is not highly liquid. So if you need to get money out of your property, um, other than potentially refinancing, going into a home equity line of credit, taking, taking money out against the equity in the property, you very well might not be able to take, you, you might have hundreds of thousands of dollars tied up in a property, depending on how much you put down, what kind of financing you do. So this is something that it might not be a very good thing if this is going to be your only investment, because again, you're not going to be able to have this as a liquid asset. Okay. Um, also, this is something that I do not recommend for anyone who's looking to get into uh, real estate that is a very, very, very green investor. Some people think that it's going to be a quick, easy hit, especially now we have HGTV really, um, you know, glamorizing uh, the investment side of real estate. And what happens is there's a lot of risk. Um, and also you need to know what's going on. You have to have really good real estate professionals helping you as well as legal and tax professionals, because again, this is a lot of money and there are tax implications involved in it. And there's a lot of things that you really need to have your ducks in a row in order to start taking on real estate as an investment for, you know, either for a career as a side thing to do something with your money other than leave it in the bank and just, you know, leave it there or, you know, shove it under your mattress. Okay. So let's talk about the actual investment of real estate. So there are two types of uh, people that you know invest in real estate. The first one is where they hold it for appreciation. And now here's the thing. Nowadays, 2020, we have a lot of people who are holding for appreciation. And here's the thing. The hold could be a short-term hold or it could be a long-term hold. Okay. Um, so what happens with a short-term hold, we typically refer to those as flips right? Someone gets the property, they put some sort of capital improvement on the property. And then what they do is they look to sell it for uh, a gain. So what happens is they're looking for that appreciation straight up, you know, I buy it for 100,000, I want to put 20,000 in, I want to sell it for 180,000, something like that. So that's a short term hold, 
right? Or what we would more commonly refer to in 2020 as a flip. Uh, and here's the thing. I'll throw my two cents into it just for the heck of it because we're talking about it. A flip is potentially a good thing, but you do have to have, going back to the beginning of the chapter, you do have to have a lot of expertise in regards to whether you should or should not be flipping. And you need people to help you with this. This is not something that you should just go into willy-nilly, okay? You shouldn't do willy-nilly when it comes to house flips. You should really, honestly, genuinely know what you're doing because you could put yourself at a large risk. Um, the other one is when you have an income property or a rental property where it's held for producing income, okay, or giving you some sort of cash flow. You'll see some people refer to it as passive income, right? So some people are like, hey, I don't necessarily need it to gain or I don't need it to appreciate, depreciate. I just simply need to see a cash flow. I just need to make sure that I, I have X amount of dollars tied up in this. I need to see a return on that cash flow. Okay. So that's something that people might also say to you like, hey, I just want to have a cash flow. And you know what? As a real estate professional, you should be able to identify and coach these uh, investors as to what they should be doing. And also, here's the thing I will say this now, and I will say this for a test. So perk your ears up a little bit. If you ever see on a test, you know, it, they'll give you a complicated scenario. And one of the answers is, hey, should they contact an attorney? Should they consult an attorney? If it seems complicated, then you should be giving them attorney's advice, okay? Because here's the thing, especially in the state of New Jersey, we have Opinion 26 as our cover sheet for all the pre-filled contracts. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that you are not giving these individuals any kind of legal advice okay so you want to steer clear of that you want to advise them as a real estate professional right that doesn't mean that you can't tell them nothing but that also means that there's a lot of things that you probably should not be coaching them on there's a lot of things that you should leave up to the attorney or something of that nature you know because they're the ones who are going to be able to advise them as far as their legal um, concerns are, are um, you know, relate to. Because again, we are not attorneys, especially in the state of New Jersey. We need to keep that in the back of our mind and be cognizant of that. And we have to be cognizant of that. So let's talk about tax benefits, things that you could do, all this kind of jazz. So we need to talk about taxes for a little bit. The first one that we're going to have to refer to is the 1031 exchange. Anyone know what a 1031 exchange is? Guess what? I know what a 1031 exchange is. I'm going to tell you what it is right now. So this has to do with investment properties. Here's the thing. You'll probably see on the test some sort of question that will refer to what type of property the uh, investor can use in a 1031 exchange. And here's what it is. Let's say you have a property, an investment property, and you want to roll it into another investment property, okay? This cannot be a residence for yourself. So if you go and you take that, you sell property A, okay? And you take that money and you buy a home for yourself, okay? Or a vacation home for yourself. That is not like in kind. That is not an investment, okay? You have to keep it in an investment property. And here's what happens. The 1031 exchange is set up so that you could do this. You, you have to pay, as an investor, you have to pay capital gains taxes. And this is usually the difference between the adjusted basis, and we'll get to what a basis is, the adjusted basis of the property and its net selling prices. So what's, we, let's keep in mind a couple of terminology that I'm using. Gross is the total of what you're taking in. The net, think of it when you're fishing, okay? The gross is everything you catch, the net is after expenses and everything. If you drag that net in after you throw out all the mishmash, what are you netting? So after expenses, what are you netting? Okay. So the gross is everything. Net is after expenses. So what happens is this. When we're talking about capital gains, it's that amount of money. So let's just say that the adjusted basis of a home is $100,000. Okay. And then we have the um so the basis is that and we sell it for let's just say after the net selling price is going to, to be 
uh, 200000 That would be $100,000 that you would be taxed on for capital gains, okay? Um, there's a little minutia that goes into that as well. However, for the test, don't believe that that's something you're really going to need, okay? So when we're talking about capital gains, we're talking about uh, the fact that this is the taxable amount, which is the difference between the adjusted basis and the net selling price, so after expenses. And a 1031 exchange is basically this. If you take property A and you sell it, instead of paying the, let's say we're using the same example, instead of paying the capital gains taxes on that 100000 what you could do is take that money and put it into an exchange. Now that exchange is a third party, okay? They hold that money. What happens is after you sell the first property, you have 45 days to identify the second property. So basically you have to identify a second uh, property, property B, that you're going to take that 100,000 and roll it into. And then what happens is you have 180 days total to complete that whole thing from when you sell it to the uh, next transaction, okay? So what happens is it's 45 days to identify 180 to complete everything. And what happens is that 100,000 that you just put in with the exchange then goes towards property B. And when it goes towards property B, what happens there is basically you're shielding yourself from being taxed on that uh, $100,000. So it, it's a way that you can shield your investment when you are looking to reinvest it, okay? When you're looking to pull that money out and put it into another um, type of property that is not like in kind or not an investment, okay, a vacation home, a primary residence, then what happens is you will have to pay the capital gains taxes. You will not have the 1031 exchange as an option, okay? You will have to pay those taxes on the $100,000 if we're using the same example that I just did. So let's talk about the basis and adjusted basis, right? So basis is usually referred to as the investor's initial cost for the real estate. So we would say $100,000 if you were losing that, using that example I just gave you. Adjusted basis is the basis plus the cost of capital improvements minus claimed depreciation, okay? So what happens is we increase the basis based on capital improvements. So let's say I put 20,000 into it, then we subtract any kind of depreciation. Now, what we'll do is we'll talk on the next slide about depreciation and what that is. So depreciation is a loss of value in the property um, due to physical deterioration, age, and on residential properties, the cost of the building is divided by 27 and a half years. So what happens is this, it, a, a residential building basically only depreciates for 27 and a half years. Now our commercial properties, it, listen, you, you probably will not have to ever deal with depreciation on commercial properties, but you know what? I always like to tell you because guess what? More knowledge is always good. So the depreciation for, um, a commercial property is divided by 29, 39 years, excuse me. So 27 and a half on residential properties, 39 years on our commercial property, okay? So the next thing that we're going to talk about is a couple of different ways that people typically invest in real estate. So there's someone who might set up um, what is referred to as a real estate investment syndicate, okay? So a syndicate is basically the joining of two or more because obviously if it's one, you just own it in several T, that's it. There's no joint venture, okay? Um, and what happens is this. This is usually two organizations, two individuals, whatever the case may be. Um, and they sometimes carry out one more uh, or a number of projects, right? So basically what happens is this is going to be your seasoned investors. This is going to be your folks that... Um, it, it kind of, well, they should know what they're doing. If they're getting into a real estate investment syndicate, there should be some basis of like, oh, we have an idea of what we're doing over here. Um, you're not going to see someone mention a real estate investment syndicate to you and say, and really not have an idea. So, and also what happens is this, again, this is probably not something you're going to see on your test. 
However, it's this is good practical knowledge to know. Okay, so in a syndicate, they're usually going to be a business venture where they're going to pool all their resources. And when I say resources, you're talking about um, people, um, uh, business contacts, everything. So they're just going to pool everything together so that they could carry out either a single project or multiple projects. I mean, that's basically what a syndicate's going to be. The next type of real estate investment like entity that you could set up would be a REIT, okay? So that they call them REITs and they're real estate investment trust. Now there's a couple of caveats to creating a real estate investment trust. You need to have at least 100 investors and 75% of the trust income must come from real estate. So what happens is, and also again, there's a lot of things that you probably won't, if you're going through this chapter, there's minutia that I wouldn't refer, I really wouldn't get into that much. You're going to have tax benefits the same as mutual funds. And again, you're probably sitting there going, what are those? Don't need to really know them, but this is going to be set up. The reason people set this up is because it gives you the possibility of making more money, having people put together money, pools of money where maybe they only have a small amount. Okay. They can't buy one property. So maybe you have a hundred, 200, 300 people that want to invest at different levels. Okay. And they get shares into the REIT. Okay. And there's also REITs that are publicly traded. So if you went online, you're like, oh, I want to invest in a REIT. There are REITs that are publicly traded, and again, what they do is they manage them all differently. So there's all going to there's going to be different things that you're going to see in regards to um, what the REIT is investing in. But at least seventy five percent of it needs to needs to be in real estate in some manner, shape, or form, whether that's in actual properties or uh, mortgages. Okay. So the next thing is we're going to talk about business opportunities, okay? We'll talk about business opportunities. So what happens is in real estate, you could also be selling a business in addition to or just basically selling a business. I know parts of my real estate career, I have sold restaurants. I have sold um, retail stores. I have done a lot of those different things. I've actually bought some of my listings too that were businesses, you know, storefront businesses that come with leases, things like that. So basically what you need to know is that this is going to be, and again, this is something that I always tell people, you really want to get yourself familiar with it before you jump into it or partner with someone who has the wherewithal and knows how to do this. That was one of the mistakes I made early on is that I didn't know what I didn't know. And I had people eventually when I fell flat on my face in a certain at a certain point, that's when I realized I was like, okay, I need someone to help me with this. Um, and you have to realize I got involved in real estate at an early age, I was 19. Um, and I also had a situation where it was 2003. So I didn't have Google, YouTube, the internet, as we know it and love it today. So I, I had a lot of challenges ahead of me with this. And it's something that I, I really think that you guys have it a lot better than what I had. So yeah, this is something that I definitely would get someone involved who has the wherewithal to really understand this and help you navigate this, okay? But something that you will probably have to talk about, that, that we will have to talk about, excuse me, that might be on your test is referred to as the Bulk Transfers Act. So this is actually, so what happens is this is under the Uniform Commercial Code. So what people always forget is they say, oh, this is, uh, they're the same. No, the Universal Uniform Commercial Code is the actual regulation, okay? And that regulates the transfer of a real estate business. But Article 6 basically outlines the, uh, what was I going to say? This outlines what needs to happen with a lot of the inventory, equipment, things of that nature, specifically in regards to creditors, okay? So what happens is creditors need to be notified of the transfer of the business or the sale of the business, okay? And the purchaser needs to be made aware of what is happening, what's what the plan is for those creditors, okay? Uh, and, and this protects two people. It protects the purchaser of the business and or real estate. 
and it protects the creditors. So let's say there's inventory out, uh, outstanding, because when you purchase a business, there might be something that you might hear of the thing net 30 or net 60, net 90, where people are actually you know not paying for things until, so like they get the inventory and they're not paying for it in, for 30, 60, 90 days later. So what happens is those creditors do need to be informed as to what's going on and who the new owner is, stuff like that. So guys, that is, in a nutshell, Chapter 17. There's really not much else that you need to know. Look, have a fantastic day. Keep studying. And if you need anything, throw something in the comments below. I'll be more than happy to answer it.